Um, I hope you enjoy my presentation. I've chosen 10 different instruments, and I'm thinking, what was I thinking? Um, uh, it's just a matter of keeping them all in tune, and I hope you uh, enjoy the, 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 the presentation. I'm going to be covering about 900 years of music, starting with um, lyre music, um, perhaps in the 6th, 7th century, and I'll carry on until the, the 15th century. So, let me see how to start. The story of the harp in medieval Europe really begins with a lyre, and I'll start by playing one made by Tim Holbra. Just a second. That um, was based on the one found at Sutton Hoo in the 6th century, sorry, 7th century. Such an instrument was also played a thousand years earlier on the Isle of Skye. A lyre bridge found at High Pasture Cave, dating from 3000 BC, sorry, 300 BC, is the earliest artifact of a stringed instrument in Western Europe. While we don't know precisely what they might have been, what they might have played on the northern lyres, we can surmise that they accompanied singing, and they may have been used instrumentally. That we see images of King David playing such lyres suggests that they may have been accompanied um, the singing of sacred songs. Whoever was buried at Sutton Hoo, and it's likely to have been Redwald, one of the early East Anglian kings, he was interred with both a pagan altar and Christian liturgical objects. I'll represent both the secular and the sacred aspects of this instrument by playing two ancient Gallic laments and a plain song. Angelia Down is the brown-haired lad. Shinael Shagushkami means, it is this desire which has awakened me. This tune has characteristics of Danjurich, a complex form of recitative dating from the 12th century, designed to be chanted to the accompaniment of a harp. I'll finish with the plain song Vexila Regis, which was written by Venantius Fortunatus in the 6th century, and is considered one of the greatest hymns of the liturgy. Fortunatus wrote it in honor of the arrival of a large relic of the true cross, which had been sent to Queen Radegunda by the Emperor Justin II and his Empress Sophia.
people played lyres for several thousand years as found in cultures from ancient mesopotamia and africa classical civilizations in the mediterranean and in northern europe but by the early middle ages europeans mostly changed to playing harps on a quadrangular lyre all the strings are the same length there are limits for achieving a wider range of pitches however on a triangular or asymmetrical instrument it's easier to have the higher pitches using the shorter strings and to get lower pitches by having longer strings the first images of harps in europe are found on crosses carved by the picts in the ninth century these are scattered across the scottish highlands and predate the appearance of harps on irish high crosses which show lyres both quadrangular and asymmetrical there are about a dozen harps on the picture stones but we have no definitive idea of how they actually sounded we propose that they had sound boxes carved from a single block of timber and the strings were likely made from materials close to hand horsehair metal and gut i'm using a pictish harp made by artival harps with 19 horsehair strings that i made myself the triangular shape may have come from cutting a young tree with a perpendicular branch cutting at the trunk and putting a stick to support the string arm the harps are often shown in the hands of players who may represent king david he was the ideal ruler for the picks who was also a warrior, a poet, and a musician. What better music to hear as an introduction to the first European harps than something from the Robert Appiah manuscript containing the earliest harp repertoire from anywhere in Europe. I'll play, appropriately enough, Kenk David the Prophet, the song of David the Prophet. Because the Weierstromklarsuch was to become such an important instrument for the medieval gales, it's reasonable to assume that harp makers in the early Middle Ages may have experimented with metal strings. Certainly, the Picts were master metalsmiths, and we discovered that the triangular harps worked just fine with wire. Again, I'm playing a Pictish harp made by Ardival with thin brass strings. I'll play two antiphones from one of the earliest sources of music in Scotland, the Inchcolm Antiphoner, containing music from the feast day of St. Columba. The manuscript itself dates from the mid 14th century, but the music may well have been composed several centuries before that. The text for Salve Splendor is Hail Columba, our glory and our patron, sunbeam of righteousness. 
and for Pater Columba, Father Columba, splendor of our ways, receive your servant's offerings. Nowadays, we mostly expect a medieval harp to have got strings. But remember, it was just one possibility. And of course, the sound is affected by the player's technique. Notice that I'm playing with my fingernails. Just as we have evidence for using the plectrum, or the Anglo-Saxon word harpnagel, harp nail, for playing the lyre, so we have evidence from several medieval sources for using fingernails to play both wire strings and gut strings. This is Artevald's Rosmarkey model with 19 gut strings. And I'll stick with the sacred theme here and play a set of four melodies which are used for the hymn Ave Maristella. This is one of the most beautiful chants I know, and it's frequently attributed to Venantius Fortunatus along with Vexilla Regis. The text is, Hail, star of the sea, nurturing mother of God and ever virgin, happy gate of heaven.
By the High Middle Ages, we see from iconography that harps are becoming a bit larger and are acquiring curves both in the arms and in the pillars. This is Artival's Kentigern model with 23 gut strings. <clears throat> I'll play one of the tunes from the Cantigas de Santa Maria, the great 13th century collection of songs and poems recounting miracles performed by the Virgin. The title is Toda Cosa Que Ara Virgen and tells the story of how a woman had promised not to sow on the Sabbath, and because of her sinful ways, she did so, and she was crippled in her hands. She had herself carried to the cathedral at Chartres, and she was cured. I'll follow on with a French dance, La Septime et Imperial, from the Chansonnier du Roy in the late 13th century. In medieval Spain, we start to see representations of double strung harps, the arpa doble, such as one, the one played by a musical angel on the altarpiece from the Pietro Monastery, dating 1390. It's very clearly a harp with two parallel rows of strings, unlike the cross-strung Iberian harp, which will become such an important continual instrument in the Baroque era. This new model by Artival is literally a double-strung kentigern with two rows of gut strings and having the same range as the original single row model with just a bit more than three octaves. It invites the player to explore medieval chromaticism by perhaps tuning certain pitches either in unison with a flat on one side and a sharp on the other. I'd like to play a Spanish piece from the same period, the serenely beautiful Maria Matrem from the Libre Vermeil. Maria Matrem, Virginem, Atolite, Jesum Christum, Extolite, Concorditer. 
to Mary, Virgin Mother, give praise, Jesus Christ, extol with harmony. The wire strung psaltery is also an instrument which is frequently double strung. And with unison courses like a lute or a citern, psalteries are named after the Psalter, the Book of Psalms, presumably because people thought King David used this instrument to accompany himself singing the Psalms if he wasn't playing a harp. Ultimately, we'll never know what the historical David played. The Hebrew words kinor and nevel suggest lyres rather than harps. In the Middle Ages, psalteries come in many different shapes, such as trapezoids, half trapezoids, and this porca or pig snout psaltery, which was made by Lynn Lewandowski in the States. I expected to give a workshop this year playing the psaltery, and I hope you can join us next year as, a, as, as we meet then. I'd like to play several sacred English medieval songs. The first, Santa Maria Virgine, 
composed by St. Godric in the 12th century, after having had a vision of the Virgin Mother appearing to him accompanied by the Mary Magdalene. I'll follow that with a 14th century Pater Noster from a manuscript in Cambridge University Library. I'll finish with the celebrated Angelus et Virginem, which Chaucer mentions by name in his Canterbury Tales. It's played by the Clark Nicholas in the Miller's Tale. And all above, there lay a gay psaltery on which he made a nightest melody, so sweetly that all the chamber rung, and Angelus et Virginem he song. Now bear with me just for a minute, because I'm holding this in my lap. I'm going to move the camera very cleverly to show the ceiling. Yes, no, I'm going to try and direct it down to my lap to show what I'm doing. It's a bit like a cookery program, you know, to see, ah, so that's how it's done. Now, can I move this? How do I do this? It's planning to extend. Maybe I can do this like that. Oh, no. Give me just a sec. That doesn't, sort of shows you. How's that? A little bit better. <laughs> okay. Anyway, nothing up my sleeves. Here we go.
place. <coughs> The Weierstrung harp, or the clarsach, was the great art instrument of the medieval gales in Scotland and Ireland. It was used to accompany the highest forms of poetry, and clarsairs were very respected. The earliest literary reference we have to the harp in Scotland comes from Melrose Abbey, around about 1260, which describes their abbot Adam as a saintly musician. No one saw him either go to sleep or rise out of bed. And it was his custom to spend the greater part of the winter nights in playing upon the harp and singing songs which are called motets, written in honor of the Holy Virgin Mother. I'd like to play two pieces from the St. Andrew's music book around about exactly the same time. 1240 to 1245. This is one of the most important collections of polyphony from anywhere in Europe during the 13th century. Begun at Notre Dame de Paris, it somehow found its way to Fife, where composers at the Cathedral of St. Andrews contributed a substantial body of motets to the Virgin. I'll play the chant like Ave Maria, Gracia Plena, Viris in Via and also the wonderfully floriated Lux et Gloria.
by the late Middle Ages, the Weierstrung harp grew in size. That was Artival's 19-string model called the Kilcoy. And just like gutstrung harps started to enlarge, so too did the, the wire strings. And this is the rose harp that Graham was making in the video um, for the, the workshop that was broadcast earlier. It has 23, 26 sorry, brass and silver strings, carved sound box made very much in the same mold, the same manner as the um, medieval Klarsachs. I'd like to play some medieval Irish music for you now from the 15th century Antiphonary from Armagh, now in several manuscripts in Trinity College Library, containing music for the feast day of St. Patrick. The text for Exultant Filii Matris Ecclesiae is let the sons of the Mother Church rejoice and let us, their comrades, sing a hymn today. The glorious feast day of Patrick, a day of light and joy, has come. And for Ecce Fulget Clarissima, behold the shining brightness of the solemnity of Patrick, when having laid aside his body, he joyfully ascends to heaven. <laughs> Now, for my last number, I'd like to bring in the Bray Harp. As I mentioned earlier in the day, the Bray Harp, sorry, I'm just looking for my little stool here <laughs> for the harp. The Bray Harp is the ordinary harp of Western Europe. Between the 14th and the 17th centuries, it was heard in Wales into the 19th century. The Bray's are small wooden pegs which hold the strings into the sound box and they lightly touch them and cause them to buzz. In English, it brays like a donkey. And so there's a tongue and sheep, tongue and cheek, a tongue and sheep, <laughs> tongue and sheep, <laughs> I said it again, cheap, um, criticism of it. And yet it was the essential accompaniment instrument 
on the continent for Burgundian chanson. And I'd like to play a, a late medieval harp made by Artaval called the Roslyn model. And this is after its appearance in a carving in the crypt at Roslyn Chapel. We have an early 17th century Welsh poem by Hugh Machno, who is asking for the gift of a harp from Robert Apu himself on behalf of another person. He praises Robert and relates how skillful the hopeful recipient of the harp is. And he goes on to describe the harp itself with the brays as being purposeful curved pegs, having the ability to express every profound feeling. This isn't a harp just for playing dance music. I'd like to play a beautiful little chanson by Guillaume Dufay. This is the sort of thing that no one does it better than Leah, <laughs> being able to sing the parts, sing the voice, and also play the different parts. I don't know how she does it. I'm just going to play the three parts. The... Je requier à tous amoureux. I seek all lovers who are guided by their courtesy. Those who do not dare to say my love are most happily in love. And I'll finish with a 14th century Czech dance, Saldi Waldi. Thanks so much. Oh, and there was the stool. It breaks down, sorry, often falls apart. <laughs>
Okay. Lovely. Bill, that was that was beautiful. Um, Thanks just, so much. Just Good. Yes. So it's just it's, it's a, a strumming technique. There's there's six strings. Some liars could have more, and I'm I'm blocking with my four fingers. So I'm always having certain strings that are ringing, um, and I can change different chords. But basically, I can choose by virtue of stumming. which ones I'm going to allow to ring. Um, I don't have six fingers, so there's always going to be something that's open, but it's it's sort of a negative um, technique. Uh, otherwise, on wire strings, you're going to be damping the strings you don't want to hear, and here I'm releasing the strings that I, I do want to hear. But it is interesting that in Anglo-Saxon um, word lists, we have several words actually for this object, um, harpnagel being just one of them. Um, so it must have been a very important object for 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 them. Love to know. That's a uh -huh. very good question. Um, at the moment, it's it's very fortuitous that for our the length of our harp, the longest string is um, uh, within the the length of the tail. Um, it is possible, I believe, to splice, but it needs um, a bit of um, experimentation. I've been asking many people, <laughs> and uh, I've gotten some wonderful answers. Amy Flory gave me the advice of using garlic juice as a medieval adhesive to, to help grip the, the hairs and maybe um, create a bundle within that. Um, but because the, the hairs are twisted in bundles, I'm not quite sure how um, that would actually been, have been uh, achieved. Certainly, there's, we, we, there, there are different ways of, of getting the, the, the hairs, but um, it's something I'd very much like to explore. I think others have done so, but um, personally, I have not. Exactly. Well, it's, it's really a response to instruments wanting to sound like the voice. <laughs> That inevitably there's going to be the, the the question of musica ficta and whether you're going to be achieving the the, um, the the semitones by fretting or using other devices. It seems that this instrument that appears in the the monastery in Spain is independent of anything going on in Italy. Um, it we don't necessarily get the idea that it was a a, a long lasting tradition because in Spain they do keep the double row, but they, they, they achieve a different um, uh, uh, relationship with the strings. Separately, in Italy, we get the arpadopia, which could either have been a, 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 harp, a harp with multiple rows, that's what it is. I mean, certainly we get in Spain, as I mentioned uh, during, the, during the talk before, that Juan Bermudo cites that people are adding extra strings into a single row to give um, chromatics and coloring them red <laughs> to distinguish between the other um, strings of the, the diatonic row. And and so there's different experiments going on. So it, it's not so surprising. It doesn't have to be a direct um, uh, link that way. But in Italy, we get the um, arpadopia with the double row and then the triple row parallel. That comes to France. And then that comes with Monsieur Le Flel and the retinue of Queen um, Henrietta Maria to um, Charles the first when he, he marries her and so that is the entree into Britain for the multi-row harp which then um, works its way back to Wales I suspect through um, a player in the court named Charles Evans who saw such an instrument and he asks blatantly for to, to his, his supervisor could I have a harp just like Monsieur Le Flel's? Absolutely. Very easy for me. Pythagorean. Absolutely. Oh, okay. That's the only one. For, for, for the wire strung harps, it absolutely enhances the, the fifths, the relationships. Everything is, is, is based around that, that sonority. And so I use that 
very nicely with my others. Now, everything I've done up to the 15th century, I, I dare say that there will become post late medieval music, the need for more chromatics and the relationships between the major and the minor thirds will become really, really important. But for the medieval chromatics of the um, Libre Vermel, I felt, oh, just go for it. You know, people say, wait a minute, you, you can't do that because it's, they're not right. According to whom they're not right? I think enjoy those beautiful Pythagorean thirds and 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 listen for it. So the, the, the chromaticism that you heard, especially on the double harp, was absolutely Pythagorean. It's a very it's 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 a very, very hard thing to say because what we have to go on, two things iconography and the voice. Now, as I understand it, instruments are but a shadow of the human voice. And so, whisper it, it's true. But, um, so, so we're imitating the voice, and the voice, if you look at the range, the testatura of, of plain song, it's not really going so far. Now, Hildegard, of course, has a, a varied repertoire for her own virtuosic voice perhaps and then another repertoire for her nuns so that you get the idea that maybe there were some really amazing singers out there are you really going to find people with upwards of two three octaves it just doesn't exist so it's it's just that for me um you have to do something you have to create a sound make decisions as a heart maker because looking at the iconography you don't really get the luxury of being able to count the strings like you would looking at a photograph. So going on the evidence of repertoire and the, the, the relationship of the sizes of the instruments, we know as a heart maker what strings are comfortable, but also we're just having to make decisions after that. I don't think you can say there was a standard that all harps had a certain number of strings. Yes, there are um, uh, um, didactic instruments with say 10 strings that are shown in diagrams and 12 strings perhaps. But then don't forget that in the Middle Ages, numerology is really um, based on the 10 apostles, the 12 apostles, the the, the, the trinity, you know, the, the idea of a perfectum and a, an imperfectum has to do with the, the, the perfect number. The trinity is the perfect number and a duple is, is, is imperfect. So you get number, questions of numbers are loaded. And um, I don't think that we have any sources that say this is it. We have Machaut, for instance, who gives us his beautiful Dite de la Harpe, which is a poem that, that expresses, I love my love in 25 ways, like the numbers of strings on my harp. So that's 14th century for you. So we know that by then we had harps of 25 strings. Well, this size harp, some would say, but actually, Bill, if you look at the pictures of the images of the harp players, the harps could be a little bit bigger than that. Well, indeed they are. But the thing is that as far as iconography goes, we're not seeing a photograph. We're seeing objects kind of within a framework. And so you have to deduce function, symbolism, many things. But I don't think it's a bad thing to have perhaps a few more strings than you really need. <laughs> but I don't think there's anyone that would criticize and say, oh, 19 strings, Urgh, can't do it, take it away. It's, it's, now, I wish I had the book title. Mm -hmm. I found, I came across a book. <laughs> this sounds terrible, a book. But it contained all the correspondence of relating to musicians at court from the time of Henry VIII mm -hmm. until Charles II in one book. So it exists. And in that, you have trumpeters asking for, could I please have 
new banners. It is like Hollywood. I can have banners, please. Lute players are asking, I really, I'm not kidding, I need more strings. My strings are broken, please. And then you get this audacious request of Charles Evans, not just for more strings, but could I please have a triple harp? He was so amazed by it. It must have been just, just amazing. So that, that's all I can say. That sounds much like the response of many on the chat to your dub double harp, actually. Uh, they all want one. Um, <laughs> No, we, we don't have any surviving. We have so few instruments. We have wire strung harps that survive because they're so robust. And it is shocking to reveal the spacing because for many of the people playing medieval instruments today, they're using their fingernails or fingertips. And the wire strung harps were fingernail instruments. And so the spacing is much narrower than 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 conventional dare i say traditional um harps but you know even in our modern harp world with all the pedal harp makers around there is no standard space between salvi pedal harps lion and healy pedal harps you name it everyone has their own ideas it's not like pianos tend to have you know, uh, you know, agreed on what the, the, the key width is, not harps, and nor, neither is spacing, nor there is tension, neither is the range. So I think we have a wonderfully fertile and creative environment to explore playing harp. Greatest of thanks, Phil. Thank well, you very much. Love to all. Thanks so much. Thank you. Ta-ta.